Good morning, church. Glad to be here. Would you rather be here than in jail? (laughs) Good to have you. Welcome. A little bit different here this morning. Uh, We are celebrating the sanctity of human life here this morning, and we're going to do it in a way that might seem a little unusual to you because I'm going to teach related to the issue of abortion, related to the issue of abortion. And so, leaning right into that, this is 46 years since the Roe v. Wade decision in January of 73, where abortion uh, was made legal by denying an unborn baby legal protection under the 14th Amendment. That's actually what the decision was. It was a statement that uh, a child will not be protected under the protection of the 14th Amendment, which says that due process is for all persons. It was determined that a baby was not a person. And so that set the course for where we find ourselves now. We breathe the air of what is a political debate, often raging, hot and heated. I know it's a hot button, but we as an eldership believe we are to address this. And we are going to say this. And I want to say it in a way that is non-political, not condemning. If you're here and you've been part of an abortion, this is not for your condemnation. There's much hope in this. But I want to make seven statements about abortion. And so I'm going to give you seven things, show you them in the Scripture, and then I want to end with some things that we can do practically as a church as believers in Jesus Christ, to be salt and light. So, let's do this. Here is the very first statement. Number one, a nation falls deeper into depravity where it lacks God's objective standard. Now, let me say this. What does that mean? I know you can hear it, and you go, that's right. When people do things wrong, it gets worse. But it means a little bit more than that. What it means is that when we lack something from the outside telling us how we're supposed to look on the inside, we now become subjected to only ourselves being a standard of truth, okay? Objective means it's outside of you. It's other than you. It's not something that initiated from you. It is completely, if you will, neutral from your thoughts, feelings, or motives. It's a neutral standard. It's objective. If you've ever hung a picture, right, Or you needed a straight line, and you remember taking you ever taking one of those levels? It's got a bubble in it, right? You put the bubble up there, and you look for it to be in the middle. That is an objective standard of truth. It says this is level. And you, I've hung things in my house, and I promise you, on the level, it looks great. But I step back, and I go, "That just doesn't. That doesn't look right." Well, it's because the house partially crooked, but there's an objective standard. But do you see, if the house is crooked and the picture goes with the house, everything's crooked. If what I'm measuring by is crooked, then what I put up and call level is crooked as well. When we lose an objective standard of reality existing outside of ourselves, we can do whatever we think is right, and we'll say, oh, there's not a problem, because we've lost the objective standard. God's Word is the objective standard gift to human beings all through the history of His revelation that we would have an objective standard that says here is right, here is wrong, and it doesn't change. And when we get away from that, any nation becomes more and more depraved. This is the way that God set up Israel. Exodus 19, 5 through 6. God says, now therefore, if you will indeed obey my voice, that's the things he said and commanded them, that's what we would know as the Word of God because it was written down, and keep my covenant, that's the agreement of his laws to our obedience, that was the old covenant, you shall be my treasured possession among all peoples, for all the earth is mine, and you shall be to me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. These are the words that you shall speak to the, to the people of Israel. God gave the command. He gave the law so that the nation could look and say, that is what life is valued at. That is what's considered wrong. That is what stealing is. 
right? That is what love actually looks like outside of ourselves because otherwise what you have is a people determining for themselves what is right, what is wrong. In other words, doing what is right in their own eyes, which was the situation right before the flood. You see how that ended. Deuteronomy chapter 7, 6 through 11, God says this. He says, for you are a people holy to the Lord your God. This is the principle we're seeing, okay? The Lord your God has chosen you to be a people for his treasured possession out of all the peoples who are on the face of the earth. It was not because you were more in uh, in number than any other people that the Lord set his love on you and chose you. For you were the fewest of all peoples, but it is because the Lord loves you and is keeping the oath that he swore to your fathers that the Lord has brought you out with a mighty hand and redeemed you from the house of slavery, from the hand of Pharaoh, king of Egypt. Know therefore that the Lord your God is God, the faithful God, who keeps covenant and steadfast love with those who love him and keep his commandments. This is national Israel to a thousand generations. What's he saying? He's saying, I'm giving you a standard to live by. It's going to be outside your feelings or your experiences. It's not malleable. It's not transient. It's not based upon your situation. Continuing, he says, and repays to their face those who hate him by destroying them. He will not be slack with the one who hates him. He will repay him to his face. You shall therefore be careful to do the commandment and the statutes and the rules that I command you today. That's it. And without that objective standard, a society becomes depraved. It's nothing to freak out about. It's just reality. When you lose objectivity, you enter into subjectivity. That's the essence of Proverbs 14.34. It's a famous verse because it's in the front flap of the Gideon's Bibles. Have you ever seen those little New Testaments, remember? That they would hand out and probably still do many places. It says, righteousness exalts a nation, but sin is a reproach to any people. This word sin, according to 1 John 3.4, is actually, it's just a state. You say, well, what is sin? Well, 1 John 3.4 says that sin is lawlessness. That sin is the breaking of God's law. It's the moving away from his law. I don't want your objective truth. I'm going to make it up for myself. When a nation loses that, they become more and more depraved. We are at root issue now. So what we're seeing related to abortion is very simple. We're looking at where we came from. In other words, how we got to where we are, where we actually are now, and where do we go from here? This is the root. It's the root. It's the throwing off of the law, of of saying, I don't want your rule, I don't want your way, I'm going to do it my way, subjective to me. That's the first statement. As I say that, you can think of the news, and you can think of your headlines, your favorite uh, channel, whether it's Fox News or CNN, and you can boot it right up in your brain. Yep, some Christians do watch CNN. They see that nation, our nation. We pray for the nation. We hope for the nation. That's the root of it, though, is let's get the law off of us. Let's do things the way we want to do them. Totally subjective. We're still in how we got here. Here's the second statement. Number two, judgment begins in the house of God. Judgment begins in the house of God. What does that mean? That means when God cleans things up, he starts closest to his home. He starts with his own family. He points first to the flaws and the error and the sin and the lawlessness and the transgression of those who take his name, of those who say they're his. 1 Peter 4, 17 and 18. It's not the teaching of the text I'm trying to extrapolate, but I want you to see the principle. For it is time for judgment to begin at the house of God. And if it begins with us, that's us, the ecclesia, the church, the called out ones, what will become of those who do not obey the gospel of God? We're under his examining scrutiny. Just because we're born again does not mean God just goes, do whatever you want. There's no more covering for you, no more instruction for you. In fact, the Bible says that one that claims Christ and throws off law and says, I'm not going to obey, not keeping the law for righteousness, but the the doing of right unto good works, that that one is a liar. Judgment begins with us. 
What will happen to those that won't obey the gospel? It begins with us. Verse 18, and if the righteous is scarcely saved, he's quoting, what will become of the ungodly and the sinner? If you're talking about us first, if you want to ask how we got here, I want to say something that might push your button. And if it does push your button, it needs to push your button. We ended up in the situation we're in, not because the devil is so crafty at manipulating people in the world. It's because he's infiltrated the church and its leaders have capitulated to its desire. We have become obsessed with coddling the world, catering to the world, looking like the world, trying to win and woo the world by being like them, and then we're surprised when they come in and they demand we become more and more like them. And we've had a hundred years of this fodder. I love the church. But that's what angers me. If I didn't love her, it wouldn't bother me that much. It wouldn't be that big a deal. But I love her, and so does he. And he's jealous for her, and so am I, and so should you be. And zeal for our Father's house should rightly consume us. And we've been fed this line that if we can just woo the seekers in and be worldly enough that somehow we'll get them to come our way, that is not the gospel of Jesus Christ. God made his house the way he wants it, and he wants his house the way he made it. And his house is made up of people who are first and foremost about worshiping him and being true to his word. And the scriptures have been abandoned in America largely. And by 1973, what you had was easy believism, which had reigned through massive crusades and men going around saying, slip up your hand and whisper a prayer. I know, I know people who got saved in places like that. It was more the exception, not the rule. It was not fruit that remained. How do I know? Because I look at the nation. While churches became more and more commercialized, how can we entertain how can we become more creative so we can better engage the culture? We're not supposed to engage them. We're supposed to engage and confront them. It's a loving thing. <sighs> Matthew 5.13, Jesus said this, you, the church, are the salt of the earth. Right? But if the salt has lost its taste, how shall its saltiness be restored? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled under people's feet. This is why the world has looked at the church for decades upon decades now and just thought, it's just a joke. And the world has stolen the narrative of the church and tells them, this is who we are and this is what we want you to do. And if you want me to come to your church, I need this. I want my car wax. You better have the right donuts. The coffee better be just right. Don't say anything that angers or upsets me. Do not confront me. And I'm telling you this. We tried it. It doesn't work doesn't work. A nation of disciples doesn't do what we're doing. We're not a Christian nation. Can we understand that? Say, we're right, you're right, we're a post-Christian nation. That is arguable as well. It's not post from anything you believe. Just because you can remember reruns of Leave it to Beaver does not mean you know the good old days. The good old days are in the garden and none of us were there. And the church can now rally around candidates politically, have people give a hand. I could tell you, hey, everybody, every real believer votes Republican. Most of you would be like, that man knows the word of God. <laughs> I can condemn homosexuality. I can say we should have prayers in school. Right? I get away with it. I get away. There should be the Ten Commandments in the courtroom. We should carry pro-life signs around at rallies. But listen to me. Those are fruits. They are not roots. Because if you stand in front of most congregations, exposit the Word of God without apology, they either leave or they run you out. When you stand up and you say, your money belongs to Him. You say, well, how is that? That's... Talk about the issues that are important. That is the hard issue. There is a heart issue there. I don't know how many congregations you can stand up in front of and say, let's bring a, a John Brown. There was a John Brown here. I don't mean you, John. Let's bring up John Doe's picture on the, on the screen 
as we will do in a members meeting. This is John Doe. He is a member of Sherman Bible. He has left his wife. He is under church discipline. Treat him as an unbeliever. Try and win him to Christ, but give him no benefits of the local church. He is under discipline. Titus 3, 1 Corinthians 5, Matthew chapter 18. Most people will say, I'm not putting up with that. Right, and that's why we have the nation that we have. Because the salt lost its savor. And you can do what you want to do. I'm going to blame pulpits. I'll stand over. I'm going to go ahead and blame pulpits. I don't want to entertain people. I don't want to unhitch from the Old Testament. And you know what the carnal sin is today is to call anybody out. I know I can't. Half of you in here probably would just be mad at me if I poked your favorite false teacher in the eye. Even if I just quote the scripture. Oh, you better not say names. I get it. But it's that kind of deference to lawlessness that's gotten us here. It's true. What's the way out? Well, the way in, you flip it around, we're going to see what that looks like. I need to keep going, otherwise I'll rant. (laughs) You're like, that's not a rant yet? (laughs) Number three. An unborn child is indeed a person created in God's image, and therefore abortion is murder. An unborn child is a person. That's just the way it is. Now you say, well, we need to come up with cute arguments to somehow convince the culture that that's true. Look, the only real argument we actually have is still the Bible. It's still the Scripture. You're like, well, we got to come up with something cuter than that because, you know, the world doesn't accept that. Look, you can heal the sick, raise the dead, turn the sky from the blue to the red. doesn't matter what they feel or what they see. Some people will never believe. Remember that song? Those pictures you saw on the screen, those are actual. Those are sonogram pictures, 3D imaging. That's not a person. That's a person. But how do we know it? How do we know it? Can we actually know this? Old and New Testament, two examples. Exodus chapter 21. 21 through, or 22 through 25. This is in the law. When men strive together and hit a pregnant woman so that her child or her children come out, but there is no harm, the one who hit her shall surely be fined, as the woman's husband shall impose upon him, and he shall pay as the judge determines. Watch. But if there is harm, then you shall pay what? Life for life. Not cells for cells. Life for for life. That implies directly personhood for personhood. Eye for eye, tooth for tooth, hand for hand, foot for foot. Burn for burn, wound for wound, stripe for stripe. Why are we reading that? We're reading that to show ourselves and remind ourselves that even after 46 years of culturally denying it, it's not a choice. It's a person. It's a person because the penalty was the same for killing that baby in the womb as it would have been if it was a person even fully grown. Same testimony in uh, the New Testament. John the Baptist is our example. Luke chapter 1, verse 15, talking about John the Baptist coming and uh, Elizabeth carrying him. It says, For he will be great before the Lord. He must not drink wine or strong drink. And he will be filled with with the Holy Spirit even from his mother's womb. Look at me, church. The Holy Spirit does not fill inanimate objects. He can be near them, but He won't fill them. And this was the promise. We we see it evident. Continue forward to verse 41. Remember, Mary is told that she's going to have the Messiah. She comes to visit Elizabeth. It says, And when Elizabeth heard the greeting of Mary, the baby leaped in her womb, and Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit. And when Elizabeth explains that, in verse 44, she says this, For behold, when the sound of your greeting came to my ears, the baby in my womb leaped for joy. It's a person. It's a person. Do you know if you're guilty of vehicular homicide and you kill a pregnant woman, you have actually killed two people legally? It is a person, and therefore it's murder. Most of you, you're the choir on this. You're going, I I know that. I already believe that. Thank you. Hope you got more than this, dude, because I got up and it was cold this morning. Here's number four. Jesus forgives murderers. Praise God. 
Jesus forgives them. He forgives them. Isaiah 1.18 says, Come now, let us reason together, says the Lord. Though your sins are like scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though they are red like crimson, they shall become like wool. This was the promise hoped for in the Old Testament. Aware that you weren't doing it, you weren't measuring up. If you're here and you've been part of an abortion, I want to tell you this. Jesus forgives murderers. He does. He washes sin clean from a person's soul by his shed blood, by the sacrifice of his very life. And we need this as a church to remember this, that it's not ours to huck rocks at those who have fallen and done those things. As a matter of fact, 1 Corinthians chapter 6 is relevant for us to keep in mind. It says this, or do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived. Watch, neither the sexual immoral or idolaters, or adulterers, nor men who practice homosexuality, nor thieves, nor the greedy, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. And I know it. We can all scream amen at that, but the next verse is in the same context. It's in the same text. And such were some of you. Now, that doesn't mean if you haven't done those exact things that you're not guilty of sin. It means that describes some specific behaviors. But you were washed, you were sanctified, you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God. Jesus forgives murderers. How? By grace through faith in his name. That's how we were forgiven. And the church here in this, whether it's Grayson County, Texas, America, around the world, we have to keep in mind, and such were some of us. And if your particular penchant towards sin wasn't listed there, it's somewhere And the Bible says if you broke one part of the law, you broke the whole thing. All have sinned. All have fallen short of the glory of God. All have become lawless. That's what it means. How are you forgiven? That's the same hope we have to offer. If we don't remember that, we simply turn into moralists. We become people who only want to change people's behavior That leads us to number five. Number five, the gospel of Jesus Christ is the only power of God to salvation. The only. It's not by changing behaviors. You can call someone into guilting them, into voting a certain way, acting a certain way, but the only way that soul enters into eternal life and is forgiven for sins committed is by believing the shed blood of Jesus Christ. Paul says, Romans chapter 1, verse 16, For I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. If there is forgiveness, if there is salvation, if sins are going to be washed away, it has got to be because the gospel has been proclaimed. Okay? It's not about Changing behavior. Behavior changes when hearts are changed. Does that mean we don't want to stem the tide of murder? It does not mean that. But if the church forgets her mission, we'll simply become moralistic police. That's one of the ways we got here. Ignore the gospel. Ignore the text. Let's just make sure everybody's behavior is in line. Jesus died for sinners. And the gospel is how people receive it. That means they have to hear it. It turns out that, you know, I think it was Augustine, quote, the quote, you know, preach the gospel at all times and when necessary use words. Turns out that's not really true because no one gets saved because they go, man, she's a good girl. Lord, would you forgive me for my sins because she's a really good girl? It doesn't work that way. The sinner is converted when they hear the gospel and the Holy Spirit gives them faith to believe that Jesus is the atoning sacrifice on their behalf for the wrath of God that they deserve. That's how a man is born again. And we have to remember that. If we forget that, we we live an empty argument toward a world that has plenty of opinions objective outside of God. Got to move. Number six, our war is not with people. They are our mission field. 
Some of this you might think, you know what, I get it, but you know what, we need to say it. We need it nailed down that people are not who we're fighting against. And I don't know where, let me just say, I don't know where you rank your Bible in comparison to Fox News. Now, you might think, well, that's blasphemous. Okay, but I, I, I just, I love you. I do, I love you. But would you just, in the privacy of your own heart, ask yourself if you've had more Fox News than Bible this past month? Okay, I know it stings. I get it. I get it. There's issues. There's horrible people doing horrible things. It's true. But they're not the enemy. They're not the people that we are fighting against. It is a spiritual battle. And if you take on a spiritual battle with only natural weapons, you're going to lose. It doesn't mean we're do-nothings. We're going to get to that. But we've got to see who the root of this is. Ephesians 6, 12. We do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against, that's not civil authorities, that's demonic, by the way, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. It's not, it's not throwing rocks at people. It's not blowing up abortion clinics. It's not putting death threats out on abortion doctors. It's not making you know, death threats and, and, and castigating and screaming horrible things at women who are headed into the abortion clinic. That's not what it's about. That is not really the work of God. How do I know? Because they never did it. They never did it in the Bible. That was never what happened. Jesus did not do that. You don't think he knew where the prostitutes were meeting and where all the drunks were taking place, you know, going to the bars and where, where all the, the theft was happening? He knew all that. He didn't protest it. He didn't. He did by his righteous life. But he didn't go out and call them out in their sin just to castigate them. He was calling them to something. That's the model. Acts chapter 13, 38 and 39. Let it be known to you, therefore, brothers, that through this man forgiveness of sins is proclaimed to you. This is the Acts model. And by him, everyone who believes is freed from everything from which you could not be freed by the law of Moses. What does that mean? It means we're not after just some moral change in people. We want a heart change. It comes through the gospel, and they're not our enemies, and we're not to confront them as enemies. We're just not. Love is attractive. It really is. Love draws people. That doesn't mean we love and not tell the truth, but we speak that truth in love. Not just saying, you know, you're doing this and we're on the other side of the debate, because if all you get your perspective on this issue from is the news organizations, they make money on you being hyped up emotionally. That's how they make their money. They're in the drama business. And I know you got your favorite politicians, maybe. But I don't see the government shut down because they're murdering the unborn. Just saying. Do you? If we really cared about it, we'd change it. But the heart has to come first. And we can't, we can't win that battle if we call them our enemy. It doesn't work that way. It works this way, though. This is, this is the way God wants it. And then finally, number seven, we are commanded to overcome evil with good. We are commanded to overcome evil with good. If you look at the national landscape and you feel like what I've said previous to this, the previous six are true, how do, what do we do? We're called to overcome evil with good. We're not called to be passive. Passivity is not what we're called to. I don't care what Gillette tells you. There is a man of God that God's forming in a nation. And it doesn't abuse women and still is good at the barbecue. You're welcome. Y'all know what I mean, right? We've got an Oprah generation coming up behind us, gentlemen. We have to be fathers. It's time to grow up. We have to be able to look at young men and say, follow me as I follow Christ. I'm going to go on with him with all my stumbling, all my error. Yep, I still got errors. God's working in me. But come on, I'm a man. I'm going to love my wife. I'm going to love my kids. I'm going to be faithful to Jesus. I'm going to serve his church. Let's go forward. You don't have to surrender your masculinity to do that. We overcome evil with good. I don't have to go fight what, what the media is saying. I simply have to do what I'm commanded to do. Romans 12, 17 through 21. Repay no one evil for evil. 
Personally, I can't think of a greater evil than the murder of the unborn since 73 being legal. I can't. But give thought to do what is honorable in the sight of all. If possible, so far as it depends on you, live peaceably with all, as far as it depends on you. That does not mean passively. Blessed are the peace, what? Makers, not the peacekeepers. If you tell the truth, there could be a war. Okay, but as much as it depends on me, I want to speak the truth. I want to speak it in love. It doesn't mean I back off. Beloved, never avenge yourselves, but leave it to the wrath of God, for it is written, vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. It doesn't look like he will, but he will. Look, God is not slack concerning his promises, as some men count slackness, and he's not mocked. What men sow, they'll reap. We don't have to go try to dispense that justice or that vengeance. We're not qualified or called to that. First service, you should amen that. I lob them to you because you're my favorite, but you know. But to the contrary, verse 20, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him something to drink. For by so doing, you will heap burning coals on his head. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. Do the right thing. Do the loving thing. Do the merciful thing. In other words, look like Jesus. Tell the truth. And some people are going to feel like you flipped over their tables. They're going to get mad at you. They're going to hate you for his name's sake. That's okay. That's not your fault. But if we're ugly about it and we're vicious about it, we're vindictive about it, you know what we're doing? We're acting like we are God and we're not. We're his kids. We're his church. We are his ambassadors, but we're not him. We're just not. So it's not mine to hit somebody with a Bible. (laughs) It's a sword, by the way, not a club. It's, it's supposed to be accurate and just describe. You say, yeah, but it doesn't feel like it's fixing it. Why don't we trust what he said? That the power of God, salvation, is actually the gospel. If we go ahead and do it his way, we'd see some change, guys. We really will. It just doesn't look like it's at root, but it actually is. So what do you do? If that's where we came from, when we're here, and this is what we're actually in, and it is a murder that's going on, and... Our loyalties are to be up. We know that. And what do we do then if we're to overcome evil with good? What does that look like? I want to give you four things you can do. They're all important. All of them are important. They're not passive. Number one is pray. Pray. Pray for who? Pray for civil authorities. Pray for the president. Pray for them. Pray for those congressmen. Pray for those senators that you don't like. It's hard, isn't it? But we're called to. I'm not going to bring it up. First Timothy chapter 2, 1 and 2, read it. We're to pray for them. He said, well, it just doesn't feel like much is happening. See, that's the... Pro- mm. We got here because we think we know better than God. We'll get out of here when we realize that we don't. It, I love you. That's actually the way out. So it just feels so weak. You are weak. He's not. That's why we pray. Unless you think prayer is just speaking to the ceiling. That's another issue. Pray. B, number two, vote. No, no, that's not actually it. I got them out of order. (laughs) B, witness. That's important. What do I mean by witness? Witness. I mean, tell people what Jesus has done in your life. Tell people how the gospel is impacting you right now. Tell people how it impacted you when you first believed. Talk to people in your neighborhood. Talk to people at the grocery store. Talk to people on the airplane. Talk to people on the bus. We don't have buses here. Well, we do, but you probably don't ride them. Talk to your family. Talk to your friends. Talk to your neighbors. Talk about the gospel. Bring that to bear on your society. Witness. It's not hard. You don't need to memorize a bunch of evangelistic tools. You simply need to know, this is where I was. This is the gospel of Jesus Christ, which is why you absolutely should take the class and understand so you can articulate it. And this is how he's changed my life. Look at my heart's different. Yes, I have this struggle. Yes, I have this hardship. But this is the the testimony, whether things are good or bad. We have a young man from Sherman Bible. He is in the cancer ward at Children's Medical Center right now. 
You know what his family's saying? Glory to God, Jesus is so faithful. Look what he's done in our hearts. Cancer. 15 years old. Guess what? There's a testimony even in that. You're doing better than he is, I would assume. Witness. Say it. Start to talk about it. It's amazing how unoffensive love isn't. C, vote. <laughs> vote. You say, well, that doesn't sound very spiritual. It's very spiritual. It's absolutely very spiritual. We live in a land where it's our, 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 our privilege and our constitutional right, though not a God-given right per se, most of society did not get to vote, but we do. So guess what? Vote. Vote for issues that are pertinent to your concerns related to the, the, how the Scripture measures against what society is doing. You cast your vote. It is the way to do it. It really, really is. And I understand I'm in a red state, okay? I'm not under some delusion. But I'm not going to apologize because he didn't plant me in Southern California or someplace in crazy New York. I'm happy. I'm here with my own peeps. I like this. I guess you can preach to the choir, but guess what? We can get lazy about it. That's not activism, guys. It's, and it's simply just doing what you are allowed to do. And under God, it is as righteous as paying your taxes. By the way, pay your taxes. That's for free. So I don't like what they do with my taxes. Well, Jesus never inquired as to what Rome was going to do with the money he provided either, did he? We're still told to do it. But vote. And finally, D, number four, support. Support. Support what? Look at me. Let me be as explicit as possible. Support True Options Pregnancy Care Center. Why? Why? Because most of us will not deal with one unexpected pregnancy in our lifetime. I don't know about you, but I don't have unmarried women showing up at my door knocking going, Pastor Steve, I'm pregnant. What do I do? They just don't do it. Weird, huh? They just don't do it. But what we have is a ministry here in Grayson County that personally I wouldn't want to see Grayson County without. I don't want to see it without it. That stands at the forefront of the battle and says, listen, come to us and let us talk to you. You're in a time of stress. You're in a time of struggle. Come and let us talk to you. Here are your true options. They give them options. They offer them the opportunity to make choices. But listen, true options for us is non-optional. If you've believed the first everything else I just said, but you come to this and you go, oh, that's going to cost money. Man, I love you. You're a hypocrite. I love you. I'm not saying you're a hypocrite, but if that, see, I'm backing away. I don't want to be offensive. <laughs> come on. If, if it's dollars that keep you from, from living what you say you believe, Jesus would say, that's not really where your heart is. You can put your heart at the front, front lines of the battle by supporting true options. Every single day, every single week, all year long, they have women coming into that ministry, and they give them the opportunity, not just to not murder a baby, but to hear and believe in the gospel of Jesus Christ. So I'm going to roll this, and then I'll come back. I want to speak about one more thing, about two more minutes once this is done. Take a look at this. Antichrist, go away, you'll come back another day. True Options is called True Options today because we want to give them the truth of their options, but bigger than that, we want to give them the truth of, of Jesus Christ. We see anywhere from 80 to 130 girls each week that are coming in. We do free pregnancy tests, free sonograms. We have resources that girls can earn as they're coming to classes. Those resources include um, they can earn a free crib, a free car seat, and they earn those things by attending so many classes. We work very hard at not being a transactional organization. We want there to be a transformation. When a girl comes to us, she has three options. She can choose to parent, 
she can make an adoption plan or she can choose abortion. And we can estimate that in 2018, there's um, roughly 200 plus having abortions in Grayson County. Young women that come to us um, that are choosing abortion make that decision within about the first 72 hours of finding out they're pregnant. And so they're in a crisis mode. And we all know that none of us make good decisions when we're in crisis. The way a girl f ends up coming to us is she may Google abortion providers or abortion, just Google's abortion, and we're gonna pull up. And, if, and she goes to our website because we pulled up. And so she just calls us and says, I need to come in. Um, you know, there's lots of different requests they have. We may tell them, we would love to meet with you. We can give you a sonogram, determine exactly how far along you are. And oftentimes they will come in because we are offering them those services. Our goal is she is seen as quickly as possible and that's because we want to show her life. We want to show her that there's a heartbeat, that there is life growing inside of her. We are willing to bring her back for a sonogram as many times as she'll come. Throughout humankind, there's been issues and atrocities and sin that, that, that happens and gets brought up. And Christians are the ones that um, need to deal with that head on. And so, you know, in, in, in our uh, community right now and in our country, you know, abortion is a huge issue. And Christians have to be the ones preaching the gospel and stepping into that and, and, and pushing back that darkness. And so for True Options here in Grayson County, um, this is the front lines of that. So we trust in the sovereignty of God and we step forth and we proclaim the gospel and we give um, practical applications along with that. So this is the front lines of, you know, protecting the most vulnerable in the community, protecting those fatherless children um, that when a uh, boyfriend or parents or something like that are um, run across a woman with an unplanned pregnancy, and the solutions are death, they can come here, receive counseling, hear the gospel, and learn true options of things that they can um, walk out and, and preserve life. Um, God is the author of life. He created uh, human beings and declared them to be made in His image. That's littered throughout scripture. And so I think as Christians, we have to protect um, that image, we have to protect life, and we have to protect the most vulnerable in our society, which are, you know, widows and fatherless children. And as Christians, we need to have the same attitude of Christ, and that's with open arms, having children come sit in His lap, and loves and very much cares for children, and so we want to uh, reflect that as much as possible. Isn't that good? Isn't that good? I don't know about you, but I don't want that to leave Grayson County. And uh, what I'm going to say is it's not an option for us. It's not optional. Um, we're called as the people of God to do something when we can. And we have an opportunity with people that we trust to reach a mission field for the gospel and to see change happen right where we live. And so I'm just going to tell you, the second weekend of February, we're calling the church to a free will offering. And I know you know what this means. Um, the, the tithe is for the storehouse of God. We've covered that in the First Fruit series. You can go back and listen to that if you want to. Free will offerings are God's people saying this. This is in my heart. I want to see this happen. And then we put our money where our hearts are. And we actually lead our heart with our finances. And so Kelly and I are going to be given to this. It's not that we're not going to tithe. It's not that we're not going to help with the building. But we're going to need to give to this. And so you can give to this a couple of ways. Um, you can give one large amount there on the 10th, second, week, second Sunday of February. Um, or what you can do is you can give throughout the year two true options. You can give through Sherman Bible. You can, you can write a note down um, on a commitment card or a, uh, one of the uh, connection cards next uh, in three weeks, and you can say this is what we're going to do. So let's just let's just say you were going to give um, let's just say twelve thousand dollars. Okay, amen. So you're going to give twelve thousand dollars. That means you can either write a check for twelve thousand dollars in the second weekend 
of February, or you can just say, I'm going to give $1,000 a month for 12 weekends, either way. Now, your mileage may vary. You say, well, that, that, sir, you don't understand. I, that's what I make in a year. Okay, then you probably won't get that. But you can give something. And you know, we sometimes hear people say every little bit helps. Every little bit really does help. And so calling to you to be part of this, it's not activism. It's gospel-centered ministry to a group of people who are vulnerable and open. We have a leadership there that we trust. We want to entrust them with a gift. So as the band comes back out, would you bow your heart? And I want to pray for us before we receive communion here. Lord, I thank you for my church family, and I thank you for uh, uh, bringing my family into this house. And I thank you, Father, that we have a ministry like True Options that we can even put our finances behind. I pray, Lord, that your church would respond to this call without any kind of uh, arm twisting or manipulation. Lord, we want to do what brings you glory. And I believe with all my heart this is part of that plan, Lord, for this house. I pray for anyone here who has uh, heard anything that causes them to feel uh, dread of you or even condemnation, Lord, I pray that the gospel would be what they remember, that Jesus, you died for sin and you forgive murderers. And there's no condemnation once we come to you. And Lord, I pray that we would respond in faith, being generous like you were when you gave us Jesus. It's for the glory of your name, I pray. Amen.